everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and, and are you lonesome tonight? Well, don't have suspicious minds. Come and join me and we'll take a look at AEW Dynamite this week and give each individual segment a lovely individual grade. Let's jailhouse rock. Blue suede shoes, let's go. That's right, if you couldn't tell from my really well thought out intro there, this week's Dynamite is from Memphis, Tennessee, but it's not. It's actually from Mississippi, just across the state line, which caused me a bit of confusion. So this morning, I've been doing some Wikipedia geographical research, and don't worry, I now know the entire continent of North America inside and out. You're in safe hands, so just rest assured. And what better way to kick off the show than with a Memphis wrestling legend in the guest commentary position? That's right, Dave Brown joined our regular broadcast team. I'll be really honest with you, I'm not too familiar with Dave Brown, maybe you are, maybe that makes me a heathen and somebody who doesn't know anything about wrestling, but I don't. But I will say this, he had a, he had a lovely voice, didn't he? He commentates on one match, the opening match, which is Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. Oh, is Hangman all right? Is he still friends with the elite? Who knows? Taking on Private Party. And this uneasy tension between Page and the members of his former stable really do bubble to the surface here. A little way into the match, Page goes for the buckshot lariat, but Mark Quinn ducks, and Page nearly blasts Kenny Omega. But they stop short, they work things out, and they get back on the same page. Yep. You're in for a ride. A little bit later on, it's Kenny Omega who suffers a bit of friendly fire as Private Party double drop kick Page into Omega on the top rope and he crotches himself on the top turnbuckle. This allows Private Party to hit the gin and juice for a pretty sweet near fall, but Page gets in at the very last second and breaks it up. And there's yet another miscommunication between the two down the closing stretch as Kenny Omega flips Mark Quinn backwards into like an inadvertent Pele kick into Hangman Page, but again, they manage to get together again and work together and pick up the victory, hitting a buckshot lariat, V-trigger, sandwich combination before Kenny finishes things off with the one-winged angel. Now, Page says he's fine in the aftermath. He's like, no, it's cool, it's cool, I understand, it's fine. But he does it in the best sort of subtle way. You can definitely tell that he's still quite pissed off. But we don't have much time to think that through as we cut backstage where Pac has the brutalizer submission locked in on Michael Nakazawa in the locker room. He demands his rematch with Kenny Omega and we cut back to ringside where Omega says, right, I need to go and save my friend. And Paige is like, go on, man, go for it. Kenny sprints backstage, but we don't get to see what happened next. Um, I thought this was a decent opening to the show. And then we go to commercial break and Paige drinks several beers from several members of the crowd. I really hope he's all right. But yes, I thought this was a decent start of the show, a decent match with a good little storyline bubbling underneath. I'm gonna give it a solid B grade. Not spectacular action by any means, but a good start to the show and a good storyline looking to the future. The next match sees a commentary change as Memphis legend Dave Brown leaves the table, passing the torch to another Memphis legend, Brandy Rhodes. This is for the highly anticipated, in my opinion, AEW women's title match between Riho and Chris Statlander. And immediately on commentary, Brandy buries Chris Statlander saying she's not even a real, she's not even an alien, she's a woman with face paint on. This is Brandy, the hair collecting evil witch stable leader, saying that Chris Statlander is just a woman with a bit of face paint on. Oh no, don't do that. And, and right, before I say all this, right, I really like Brandy. I think she's a fantastic baby face when she's cutting promos in support of Cody or bigging up her own position as a strong woman in wrestling. That's brilliant. She's great at that. But this heel character, I really don't think is working for her. I think it's risking the burial of other key members of the women's division. I mean, immediately from the jump in this match, she's just firing shots at everyone and they're pretty damaging ones in my opinion. She says, for example, that she'd rather be taking a nap than watching this match. She blasts commentary for inviting her out here when she doesn't even want to be. She blasts Britt Baker, who sat in the crowd with Hikaru Shida, saying that Britt Baker's not even a real dentist because she just seems a bit stupid and I wouldn't want her looking at my teeth. She's firing shots at everybody and just crapping all over everything. It makes you want to kind of turn it off. It makes you think, why should I be watching it if you're not into it? Brandy also takes aim at Excalibur, taking issue with the fact that he always wears a mask. Uh, she says, do you ever take that mask off? Excalibur goes, yep. She goes, do you ever shower? He goes, yeah. She says, do you ever take the mask off to shower? And he goes, yeah, I do. Then she just cuts to the chase and goes, why do you always wear the mask? Are you so ugly underneath? And Excalibur goes, no, I um, grew up wrestling in the lucha tradition and to carry that forwards, that's why I wear the mask. 
And then JR has to be like, and back to the action now. It's, it's really uncomfortable, man. The bout isn't even a few minutes old, really, when we get interference as Melanie Cruz, or just Mel, as they seem to be calling her, uh, and Awesome Kong, two members, of course, of Brandy's Nightmare Collective, make their way slowly down the ramp and menacingly surround the ring. Brandy, by the way, on commentary, denies any knowledge of why they're out there. Riho lands on the apron after a little bit of an exchange and that leaves Mel open to yank her off the apron from the outside and hurl her into the crowd barricade because Riho needs to be out of the way. There's some serious storyline development to be getting on with, boys. Chris Statlander, though, is not happy about her match being disrupted in this way. She dives onto Cruz outside the ring. She dives onto Kong on the other side and Brandy says, right, this is broken down. I need to take control. And she removes her headset. She walks out of the commentary position and down the ramp and gets in Chris Statlander's face. Face. But it's all a distraction as Brandy is jawing at Chris Statlander and she's jawing back at Brandy. That bald man from the video packages scuttles out from under the ring and rises up menacingly and grabs Chris Statlander and that leaves her open for Awesome Kong to charge in and take her down with a big clothesline. But who is it? Who is this mystery man? It's Luther. Dr. Luther, sometimes known as. Other times he's known as Luther Sinclair. He's, uh, according to Excalibur, a Japanese wrestling deathmatch legend. Did a bit of research. He has wrestled in the 90s for promotions like FMW, for example. WAR, Wrestling and Romance. That's Genichiro Tenryu's promotion. So he has been around the block a little bit, but he is in his 50s. So why have they signed him when he's not that big of a name in the West? It might have something to do with the fact that he's Chris Jericho's friend. I don't want to cast any sort of allegations in that way, but it might be, it might be because he's pals with Chris Jericho. I don't know. Who, who knows why Luther's there? Maybe they've got him in line for a title shot. Anyway, the Nightmare Collective urge Riho to climb the top rope and to finish off Chris Statlander, who's now down in the ring. Riho climbs up top, but thinks, no, I'm not having this. And she instead turns and dives onto Luther on the outside. And for the next sort of minute or two, we do get a nice exchange between Riho and Statlander. It's almost like a finishing stretch of a, of a real match, like a normal match, with them both getting some convincing near falls. It's all picking up again, but once again, the Nightmare Collective ground momentum to a halt. Statlander has Riho in position for a big slam, but instead Awesome Kong reaches through the bottom rope, snags her leg, and Riho falls on top of Statlander for the pinfall. It's a very anticlimactic ending. Melanie Cruz and Awesome Kong enter the ring after the match and try to do a bit of a beatdown, but don't worry, because Hikaru Shida's in from the crowd to save the day and help run off the heels. But Britt Baker stayed in her seat. Very interesting. Well, mildly interesting. Unfortunately, I can only really give this a D grade. I understand that sometimes you have to have matches like this, matches that have a lot of interference, just to further storylines a little bit, especially on weekly television. But at the same time, this really wasn't the time to do it. Many people, including myself, were really looking forward to Riho versus Statlander. It looked like it had the potential to be a really good title match, and instead we got this. Uh, I really don't think a lot of people are excited for the Nightmare Collective's developments, even with Japanese wrestling deathmatch legend Luther on board. Next up, singles action as Christopher Daniels takes on the Inner Circle's Sammy Guevara. They have a back and forth match, a pretty short one actually, but a competitive back and forth match without ever really breaking into that next gear, that next more spectacular level. But it's perfectly fine and both guys are obviously really good in-ring talents. That's such a disservice to Christopher Daniels. He's a really solid worker, guys. But they are really pushing this idea on commentary that Daniels may be losing it. He may be giving into father time and basically losing his wrestling ability piece by piece. This comes after he botched that Arabian moonsault the other week. About four or five minutes in, Daniels has the upper hand. He has Guevara prone on the canvas and he looks to be setting up for some kind of move in the corner. Now, I would assume that it was going to be the Arabian Moonsault because of the storyline I've just described that they're really pushing on commentary. But that's normally off the ropes, isn't it? When Daniels does it, I'm not certain. But when he's in the corner, surely he's going to go for the BME, the best Moonsault ever. Maybe it's just a similarly high risk move that they're wondering if he can still hit, I suppose. He never gets a chance to hit it anyway because Pentagon comes out onto the ramp with a microphone and says, go on, Chris, show me you can still do it. Go on then, go on, Daniels. And Daniels is like, mate, I'm having a... I'm having a wrestling match here, what are you doing? Daniels obviously is distracted and hesitates and this gives Sammy time to roll out of the way. But to be honest with you, I think Sammy rolled out of the way far too early. He rolled out of the way almost as soon as he was positioned there by Daniels and as, as soon as Pentagon came out really. There was never an opportunity anyway for Daniels to be hitting that move. 
I think, anyway, unless I've misconstrued the situation. But regardless of that, um, Pentagon's distraction allows Guevara to recover, take control of the match, and absolutely deal with Daniels with a gnarly super kick to the back of the head, dudes. And that's enough for the three count. After the match, Daniels is left alone in the ring to contemplate his defeat, and that is the cue for the Dark Order to hit the ring, accompanied by their newest members, Alex Reynolds and John Silver. Yahar! It's not a pirate. Evil Uno is on the mic and talks up Daniels as a legend of modern wrestling, which he totally is 100%. But he says, you know what, Chris, you are losing it a little bit, but there's a way you can get it all back. And that is by joining the Dark Order. He offers Daniels a mask. Daniels looks at it for a second and thinks, no, throws it back in Evil Uno's face and the brawl is on, except it's one man, Daniels, against all of the Dark Order. So it's not going too well for him. But he is saved by not only his stablemates, Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian of SCU, but the Young Bucks as well, which is very charitable of them. Nice, nice to see. Um, all the baby faces rush the ring, clear out the Dark Order, and Daniels finishes off the beatdown with the BME, which he can still totally hit, by the way, that was never in doubt, onto Alex Reynolds. Unfortunately, this gets a C. I mean, I think the action probably warrants more than a C grade, but it was a little bit of a jumbled mess, and also, the big thing that I think affecting it is the fact that it came so soon after the Nightmare Collective angle and it was a little bit too similar to it. So when you put the Dark Order and the Nightmare Collective in segments next to each other, you're probably not going to get the best result. It's just a bit too samey AEW. Can the show regain momentum? Because at this point, things had really ground to a halt. And just looking at Twitter, you might have thought they'd done some sort of awful angle because the criticism was pouring in. But could they regain momentum? Let's find out. When things are looking bleak, you turn to your golden boy, don't you? And there's only one golden boy in AEW, not golden boy, Cody Rhodes. It's Cody and Dustin Rhodes taking on Pentagon and Phoenix, the Lucha Bros. Cody and Dustin are accompanied by Double A, Arn Anderson, the head coach of the Nightmare family, and he puts his coaching to good use because at one point Phoenix tries to bring a steel chair into the match and gets on the apron with it, but Arn kicks it out of his hands. Thanks, coach. That's what coaches are for. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it's an entertaining match. There's some sweet double team moves from the Lucha Bros, as you'd expect. Cody and Dustin's timing is absolutely perfect, especially Dustin. He's so good. He's obviously still got it, as we all know he does. Uh, and they get the win. The Rhodes brothers pick up the victory after a Cody cutter and Dustin's final reckoning. Dustin gets the pinfall. Go on. After the match, Tony Schiavone gets in the ring and wants to interview Cody about MJF stipulations leading to a possible rematch. But he never gets a chance to interview Cody because Arn Anderson steps in and says, who died and made MJF God? Why does he have such sway around here? We're going to consider his offer and we'll get back to you next week. This gets a B plus, really fun match. I enjoyed it quite a lot. But more importantly, I do not trust Arn Anderson for a single second. Maybe it's because he's a horseman and Cody's surname is Rhodes and they don't have the best history. But I just, I don't trust him for a single second. I'm really worried. Please watch out, Cody. Don't fall for a friend turning on you again. You're not Sting's son, you're Dusty's son. Next up, here comes MJF with Wardlow, and MJF has proper heat, doesn't he? Oh, yes, he does. He's telling people to kiss the ring in the front row. There's a sign in the crowd that says MJF is a virgin. He's flipping off the rockers who are in the front row. Not the rockers, the Rock and Roll Express. Sure, Michaels and Marty Jannetty, just for the record, are not in the front row. MJF gives Cody 10 seconds to come out and face him like a man, but obviously Cody's just had a match, and Arn Anderson's probably there to calm him down and let him remain tactical and everything. So instead, DDP's music hits, and out he comes to a monstrous reception. DDP shouts out Dusty Rhodes and then just starts whipping out the, the sort of eight to 10 year old range of schoolyard insults. He calls MJF Motormouth Jack Off Friedman and his big heavy Ward Blow. <laughs> What? He then teases coming back for one more match, but MJF laughs at this and says, look, in your prime, you couldn't lace my boots even then. And nowadays, you can't even hold my jock strap. DDP gets aggressive, but here come the mercenaries that MJF paid off upon their debut in the company, the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny. MJF's now suddenly more confident, now he's got more numbers around him and says, you know what, DDP, WCW is dead, you need to calm down. And by the way, dead is the average age of your fan base. He also says, you've got two options, either kiss the ring and get out of here, or we can do this the hard way and send you straight to the hospice. Not even the hospital, the hospice. Very offensive. He also implies he's gonna bang one of DDP's daughters. And that's enough. Like, DDP's just absolutely had enough. He goes for MJF. The Butcher and the Blade get in the ring. Bang! Diamond cutter to the Butcher. Bang! Diamond cutter to the Blade. MJF with a low blow from behind. Oh. 
The Butcher, the Blade, the Bunny, MJF and Wardlow are all about to beat up DDP, but here comes the cavalry as QT Marshall and Dustin arrive to chase them off and make sure that DDP is okay. I'm going to only give this, I think, a B-. minus. It did feel like a bit of a filler segment, even though MJF was great on the mic, as always. But still, at least it's kind of boiling things over until we get to Cody's response next week. I was just hoping for that a little bit sooner, but I guess they've got to fill a bit of time until the next pay-per-view. In fairness, it has set up a six-man tag team match for next week, which is, I think, QT Marshall, Dustin, and DDP taking on MJF, The Butcher, and The Blade. I think those are the guys in the match. Check that. I'm not certain. Next up, another tag team match. Six-man action this time as Jurassic Express. All three members take on Trent, Chuck Taylor, and Orange Cassidy. The best friends and Orange Cassidy. Marco Stunt is really over in these opening exchanges because, as it turns out, he is from Mississippi. And even though we're in the Memphis area, as I said earlier on, that is still near, it's, it's in Mississippi, near Memphis. I get it. Don't worry, guys. I get it. Luchasaurus gets the hot tag at one point and just wrecks shop on the best friends. So they are forced to tag in Orange Cassidy. And of course, everybody is delighted. Cassidy is lighting up Luchasaurus with stiff strikes. Uh, and with a little help from the best friends, he actually gets the better of Jurassic Express during this hot tag segment. It's really weird, but it's very entertaining. He does the hands in pocket suicide dive. At one point, he gets on the top rope, signals for a 450 into the ring, and then just falls off, which drew, I actually audibly laughed at in the office. Luchasaurus hurls Marco's stunt like a weapon uh, off the apron into two opponents on the outside. Meanwhile, in the ring, Jungle Boy and Chuck Taylor are the legal men, and Jungle Boy catches Chuck Taylor in a Hurricane Rana into a pinfall for the victory. I enjoyed this match uh, about the same amount as I enjoyed the Rhodes Brothers tag match actually. That previous one was a little bit more technical, this one was a little bit more fun, but I think that balances out and gives it the same B plus grade. Even if, on commentary, JR at one point called the promotion AWE instead of AW. He did correct himself, but come on Jim. And finally, the last segment of the night, the big answer from John Moxley. Will he join Chris Jericho and the Inner Circle? Jericho comes out from the entranceway with Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager as backup. Moxley comes down from the crowd and they're all in the ring and everybody is waiting to see what Moxley says. Jericho says it's a big day around Memphis. Not only, well, not because it's Elvis Presley's birthday, because he'd kick his ass if he were around and also the Beatles were way better. That doesn't get as much heat as I thought it would. No, he says it's it's a big day because we're going to find out Moxley's answer. Jericho asks him the question, will you join the inner circle? And Moxley says, none of you know my motivations. It sounds at first like he's going to accept it. He says, you don't know what makes me tick. None of you really know what drives John Moxley. Then he starts talking about the material things that Jericho has offered him. The car, the part ownership of the inner circle. And he says, I didn't come here for material things. Now it sounds like he's going to reject it. He says, I didn't come for material things. I came to AEW to dominate, which is why I'm saying yes. Everyone's like, what? What are you talking about? Moxley zips off his bomber jacket underneath. He's got an inner circle t-shirt on. He says, I, I came here to dominate and I'm going to dominate with the inner circle. He's, everyone's like, everyone can't believe it. They pop the bubbly and everything. Moxley starts saying Jericho's catchphrases. He says, oh, come on, Le Champion. Pop open a little bit of the bubbly. It's all, it's all wrong. It's all so wrong. They spray champagne everywhere and Moxley lingers near the camera at ringside and kind of twitches, kind of twitches a little bit. He's got a bit of bubbly in his eye maybe. Or is it a wink? Moxley cuts the music mid-celebration. There's been music playing, by the way. He cuts the music and says, by the way, Chris, you forgot one thing. You owe me a little Ford GT, mate. Chris is like, of course I do. And he gets the car keys out. He gives them to Moxley. Moxley's dancing around. Everyone's chanting, you sold out. You sold out. Jericho gets on the mic now and says, that's right. He did sell out because he does big business every single night. And he's going to continue to do so in the inner circle. He then says, and I'm glad he referenced it, myself and John both won our matches at Wrestle Kingdom in Tokyo and that means that together we're going to be even more dominant. Moxley directs Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager who are on the outside. He directs them further away to get rid of a sign he doesn't like the look of in the crowd or something. It leaves him and Jericho alone in the ring. And I think if you've ever watched any wrestling before, you might know what's about to happen. He gets the mic, but it's the most wonderfully John Moxley way. This celebration has been dragging on for a few minutes now, by the way. It's been really over the top. And Moxley goes, oh, Chris, one more thing. I was just kidding. <laughs> that's, that's really, that's really John Moxley. He says, I was just kidding. I would never join the inner circle. They're a stupid group. You're stupid. Um, yeah, you haven't got anything that I want. Apart from that, 
and he points to the AEW World Championship on Chris Jericho's shoulder. Bam! Bottle of champagne or bottle of bubbly sparkling wine over Chris Jericho's head. Great visual. Jericho falls down. Paradigm shift. It's a little bit sloppy, but who cares? It's all kicking off. Sammy Guevara runs in. Paradigm shift to him. Jake Hager runs in. Moxley grabs a bottle of champagne to hit him with. It pops in his hand. He just gets out the ring. Maybe a bit of sugar glass going on there, but we'll ignore it. We'll ignore it. <clears throat> Moxley gets out the ring, not daring to square off with the five-star wrestling champion of the world. Wise decision and gets out of there, taking off into the crowd. Everyone's cheering him on. It's a great closing scene. Moxley has rejected the inner circle's offer. He's beaten them up and he's announced his intentions to go for the AEW world title. And that's how the show ends with an A grade from me. Yes, yes, absolutely yes. It may have been a bit cliched. We've seen it all before with the likes of Stone Cold Steve Austin during the Attitude Era, but it is still fantastic when it's done right. And this was totally done right. The payoff was totally worth it. And it was a nice Moxley spin on the whole trope. It was the nice sort of understated way he did it at the end, which infused the segment with his own unique brand of charisma. Unfortunately, the show was weaker than that closing segment, I have to admit. And I have to give it overall a B minus grade. Now, I checked out some of the opinions on Twitter regarding this show, and I thought I was going to end up giving it a lot of a lower grade than a B minus because everyone seemed to be really negative towards it. I will admit the Nightmare Collective segment was bad. The Dark Order segment was also bad in part just because it followed the Nightmare Collective segment. But I don't think the show on the whole deserved to be criticized as much as people have been. I mean, you had three really solid tag team matches and I enjoyed all of them. You could say the singles action was a little bit lacking this week, but on the whole, I thought it was an okay show. No more than a B minus, still a weak show and possibly the weakest Dynamite yet. Can they recover from that? Last time there was a weak Dynamite, I think they bounced back really strong the next time around. So we'll see next week if they can do so. Join me then and let me know what you think in the comments down below. I don't know why I always say that because my outro dude says it right now. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.